church has officially begun. Um, I don't know what happened to the slide. I apologize. That was on me. But yeah, house churches have begun. Uh, so we're meeting every Friday night in various people's homes for dinner, fellowship, prayer, and sharing. If you are interested in joining a house church, please talk to Pastor Mimi. So we've already started house churches. Uh, new announcement, pretty important. So next Sunday, immediately following worship service, we will have a congregational meeting. Uh, and this meeting will be to discuss and approve the changes for our procedure for nominating and electing elders and deacons. So please do uh, plan to be there next Sunday, October 2nd, right after Sunday service. On that note for Sunday services, uh, we've been announcing this for the past couple weeks, but we are pushing up our Sunday service time to 12.15 p.m. beginning October 2nd, which is next Sunday. So next Sunday, if you show up at 1, you will be coming towards the end of service. So show up at 12.15, we'll get started then. Um, we're gonna roll into offering and giving, but we do have a, a special guest with us, as you guys know. Uh, missionary Ken Kenneth Bay is here to share the word with us. Um, and today you can give on the Church Center app for the uh, missions giving as a special offering and all of the proceeds, if you choose to give, will be going to Missionary Kenneth Bay. So that option is available. So at this time, we'll continue worship through giving. Uh, you may give electronically, and we do have an offering plate for those who want to give physically. So let's do that. Let's go into a time of giving. Father, we thank you for this house. We thank you that you are good, that you are Lord. And so we come and uh, we just ask that you would come and bless uh, the small loaves of fish and, fish and bread that we have. God, we ask that it will multiply for your kingdom. And so we worship you through our giving. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am not Kenneth Bay. I want, I want to take time to introduce um, our friend. And I, last time when he came, he gave me this, this book with the thing that, that he signed it in the front. So anyway, uh, Pastor Ke Kenneth Bay has been to our house for, I think, since 2008, I believe, for 14 years ago. And uh, he has been, um, he was a, a, came to States when I was in teens. And he, he went to high school in California, went to school in, uh, in Oregon, and also went to, I think, a seminary in St. Louis. And uh, um, he was a part of YWAM and missions for a while, and he has been doing missions in China as well as North Korea. And what, he's really well known because of his love for the uh, nation of North Korea. And 2012, you know, in, in one of his trips to North Korea with a number of uh, uh, tourists, and he was detained for over two years. So it happens in our church, a lot of our friends in our church, our missionary friends, tend to be in prison for two years. Andrew Brunson was in Turkey for two years, and he started by being in, in North Korea for two years. Yet he, I think, might be the uh, 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 longest prisoner in North Korea since the Korean War. I believe, and uh, his, I, m I remember when he was released in 2014, two years later, Pastor Shin was here with us during a prayer conference. And I remember Saturday morning, Shin woke up and told me that God told me he's going to be released today, and that afternoon he was released. And so I remember that as he has been with us a number of times, that he, he's here to share God's heart and, 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 and for the North Korea as well as what God is doing, what God has really speaking in this generation at this time. Pastor Kenneth Bay is here. God is good. All the time. God is 
like uh, uh, I do believe the last time I was here at Hope was 2008. This is when the, I was working as missionary in China. Uh, and then I think after that, the 2009, some of you have visited you know, people as uh, us in China. We have done our ministry together. But it's amazing that I'm able to stand here uh, with you, in front of you, uh, testify what God has done in my life and what God is doing right now in North Korea. Um, I was just, just like I said to you, just introduced. I was born in South Korea, but our family moved to the United States when I was 16. So after, so I went to seminary and so on, but I ended up in Wawem Kona and then went to be a missionary to China and, and so on. But while I was serving in China, but it wasn't that, that I wanted to go to North Korea, but happened to be a lot of missionary there who's been, uh, who's been working with North Korean people been coming to us, and then uh, I've been working, and then saying, that, you know, could you bring some people over the border and pray together? So that's how we began. We brought people to uh, North Korea, uh, the border of North Korea. Uh, but it all began with the outreach team in 2005. I was, um, you know, uh, actually 2006, I was a part of the outreach team. I was leading the outreach team. Um, and then we decided to stay, you know, after the BTS. We instead of going back, we say, hey, we're gonna, who stay outreach need to be two months. We stay longer. And so while we were doing that, there was another team from Kona came, uh, led by someone that you, maybe you know. His name is Michael. <laughs> he was 19 year old. Uh, I call him 19 year old boy. Then, you know, he was 19 year old, but he was leading another four 19 year old team. There was like a team of four or five. And then, so I brought them to the city called Dandong, right next to North Korea. We prayed together, we got on the boat together. We just, we went to the cave, little cave, we pray and we worship that God will release the people in North Korea together. Um, and then now, I mean, the, you know, now we know the, the whole story. After that, uh, things kind of developed from there. but. Um, 2012, I was detained in North Korea because um, I brought a portable computer hard drive as a mistake. This contained uh, some uh, Western media footage about North Korea. They didn't like the fact that the kids are you know, picking up the garbage on the floor, trying to eat something. And they didn't like the fact that, why did you bring such a hostile material into our country? They're offended by it. But in this hard drive also contain all my mission support letter, or the report about North Korea and China. So as a matter of time, they discovered they will discover that I made true identity, not a tour guide, but as a missionary. Um, I I went to North Korea for this pur this purpose because I really felt that because people over there they cannot worship the Lord. So we, as a worshiper, go to North Korea, pray for the people of North Korea, and worship in behalf of people in North Korea, and love them as Christ loved us, and claim the land for Jesus. What had happened to this uh, nation, this city that we're about to enter in? So uh, I decided to um, bring 300 people, intercessor from around the country, to North Korea within a one year period of time, 2000. Um, it was 2011 to 2012. I brought 300 people from 17 different nations. We went to claim the land for Jesus, pray for the people, worship in behalf of North Korean people, love them. Uh, so that went on, and then we went everywhere inside of North Korea. I've been to most, most of part of North Korea, and then I was detained. I was taken to uh, by a National Security Bureau, and I was interrogated day and night. On the third day, they made me stand still in the middle of the room. So I had to stand still like this without moving. Uh, if I move a little bit, they will come in and yell at me, but they're looking at a, a hidden camera somewhere. So I had to stand still, for absolutely still for hours. It was very, very difficult to do so. 
but something amazing thing happened. My back's not hurting, my leg's not hurting. I wasn't tired, I wasn't sleepy, I wasn't even hungry. But inside, uh, I was panicking, worried, I was, uh, I was just blaming myself about why did I make the mistake? And now it's not just me, but so many other people that their life is at stake because of me. So I was pondering, pondering, and finally asked the Lord, Lord, where are you? You've been with me for the last six years in China and North Korea, but why now? I felt like maybe he has abandoned me. It was in November, it was very cold in the room, but my hands started to get warm. I, was, I opened my palm, I saw something sparkling like a gold dust. And then the warm started to spread into my left arm. I had no idea, this never happened in my whole life before. So suddenly the Lord spoke to me, Holy Spirit is holding your hand, do not fear that I am with you. Cast all your anxieties upon me because I care about you. First Peter 5, chapter 7, First Peter 5, 7. And suddenly all my worries are gone and panicking, I wasn't panicking anymore. And suddenly the presence of God was so thick in the room, the peace of God was coming over. I was starting to feel so joyful. I was starting to feel so joyful and I was starting to feel so happy and I'm starting to smiling because I'm in presence of God. I'm in awe in front of his presence. And then apparently they saw that I was smiling on the camera and then I can, say, I can hear them talking from the other room. Hey, wait a minute, this, it's not working. This guy's smiling. And then they came in and said, just go to bed. It's not working anyway. <laughs> So I lay down on my bed and I was tears dripping down because, you know, Jesus said, I am with you, Kenneth. I thought he has abandoned me. I said, no, I am with you. But one thing he did not say is, by the way, you're going to be here for another 732 more days. He didn't say that. Okay. But I knew that there was a purpose why I was there. On the third day, and then the fourth next day, then I, I realized everybody I brought in, they left the country safely. So I finally said, I'm ready to tell the truth. I am a missionary. I'm a pastor. I brought people here to pray and worship. And they just couldn't believe what I was talking about. And then they just, was, was a, was a, they were speechless for about maybe 30 seconds. And then I said, how, how dare you have done this, such things like this? It must be somebody else behind this to directing this kind of you know, activity. So who sends you? I said, God. Who's above you? I said, God. Who else is out there? No one. You know, we're going back and forth. Finally, they say, you tried to overthrow the government of North Korea. And I said, what are you talking about? Oh, how did I try to overthrow the government? Through prayer and worship. I said, excuse me, you don't believe in God, why do you believe in prayer? You have more faith than most Christians do. <laughs> because we as a Christian, we don't pray, we don't think that, you know, what's going to happen to North Korea? Nothing's going to happen even if we pray, so we don't pray. Apparently, I brought 300 intercessors from every continent to walk on the land, claim the land for Jesus. We pray and worship and love the people as Christ loved us, and they felt like that we are a threat to their society. And then there's actually one person from North Korea that came over to our center in Dandong, and they, they, she spent about a year with us, studied, the, you know, she finished DTS, uh, SPS, I mean, like Bible school, and this council, I mean, mission school. After one year, she says, I want to go back to North Korea to start an orphanage. The kids are dying on the street. I want to go love them as Christ loved us. Love, you know. So we send her. Guess, guess what? Because of me, she was being questioned. I realized, I didn't realize at the time, you know, that she was able to, she actually turned herself in before she was actually pardoned. So she was going to be okay, but I didn't know whether she was going to be okay at the time. So I argued for her sake. You know, she was trying to start an orphanage. But she couldn't start one. She tried though. So why is that a crime against the state? And this is what they say. If one person becomes Christian, come back and start an orphanage, 10 children will become a Christian. 
10 will become 100, 100 will become 10,000 someday. When that happens, do you think they're going to be threat to us or not? I say, maybe. See, what you have done is you try to inject us with a Christian virus, and virus will spread like a COVID, you know. <laughs> and then everybody will turn to God, and then this country will fall. When he said that, I felt like the Lord himself spoke to me. Yes, one person can transform the nation. Prayer can transform the nation. And they said, you are the most dangerous American criminal we have apprehended since the Korean War. Because now only you try to do mission work, you mobilize, you train, you brought people to North Korea to become a missionary. Therefore, you must pay for your crime. You are going to face death penalty or life in prison. You will never be able to go home. We'll make sure you pay for your crime. I was sent to Pyongyang, the capital city. I was indicted, and I got, uh, and then at the Supreme Court, I, there's only one trial, by the way, 90 minute trial, uh, to decide on my fate. I got 15 years of hard labor sentence. The prosecutor said, Congratulations, you didn't die. But I was the first American who was sent to America, the labor camp in North Korea. When I went to the labor camp, there were about 40 or 50 guards that worked in there. It was especially designed for foreigners. When I got there, I was the only prisoner there the whole time. I have to get up early morning, like 6 o'clock, and I have to work from 8 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock, six days a week, outside, doing hard labor, digging the ground, carrying rock, and you know, just uh, many type of uh, hard labor I had to endure. At night, and usually in summer, so hot, I drank like five gallons of water, and I don't want to, I had, you know, but I don't need to go to a restroom or anything like that. Because all sweaty, I was sweating out. And the winter time is so cold, uh, my hand, you know, feet is getting, you know, freezing, but, you know, I mean, the, I mean, the you know, body is warm because I was working, you know, outside, you know, it was many different type of, uh, um, doing the physical labor. So extremely difficult. So and I, at night, when I come back from work, I have to sit in the chair and before, until 10 o'clock, and then they say, go to sleep. Then I can lay down. So even that, there's a big light like this on all, all night long. So it's hard to go to sleep with the light on. Not only so, my room is the only room that has a light on. So so much, so many bugs were coming in. There's no, you know, box screen or, you know, there's no, you know, anti box screen or anything like that. So guess what? I have to kill about 200 to 300 bucks per night. Even then I'm so tired. Sometimes that this big bug will end up in my face. I just let it, you know, stay there until you slide off somewhere sometime. So my head was getting um, just hurting. Um, so I have to get up every hour, shook my hand for about 20 minutes, and then go back to sleep. I went back to sleep and going back and forth like this. So suffering was real. So I finally asked God, Lord, how long will the suffering will last? You know, you say on the third day, you be my rescuer, you are with me, but I'm the one, first one to go to the, you know, uh, yeah, I'm in prison, labor camp, I'm about to die, you know, any time. So I said, how long, O oh Lord? But the Lord said, Kenneth, even suffering is beneficial for you. But he said this, but my grace is sufficient for you. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, God's grace is sufficient for you? I didn't like his answer at all. <laughs> I want him to say, yes, I will take you home. You know, suffering is finished. But instead, he said, even suffering is beneficial. Hang in there, Kenneth. But I am with you. My grace is sufficient for you. When you are weak, I am strong. So I had no choice but to fix my eye upon the Lord and trust him at all times because I have no one else to, you know, to ask for any help. 
guess what? Because I was one of those, um, you know, I was in good behavior. They gave back the Bible that I brought in. I read it. I read uh, more Bible in in my whole life than in North Korea. I read more there. I praise God more. I worship more in North Korea. Every every single chance I get, out of desperation. Otherwise, I feel like I was gonna die. But I had a book of God's Bible with me, um, so. I have no idea why God put me through that kind of trial at the time. But through that, I was getting closer and closer to the Lord. Um, on Sunday, they made me, stand, uh, they made me uh, sit in the chair and they say, okay, resting day today, but only thing is you have to watch TV. And yeah, 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 cartoon day, no. There's only one channel. All about Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un. It's all about them, their how wonderful, great, you know, you know those things. So, oh, I have to watch it like 14 hours a day. You know, just if I better, I better want to go out and work than doing that. But so I was just sitting there, you know, watching some documentary film. I've already watched like five times that week. And I said, oh, I was just thinking about food because I was always hungry. In North Korea, in prison, they just give soup and rice and two pickle and three times a day. But I was always hungry. I was thinking about daydreaming about food that I was craving. Number one, Hawaiian chocolate with the macadamia nut. <laughs> See, I'm wearing Hawaiian shirt right now. Second thing is Kit Kat. Third thing is beef jerky from Costco. The fourth thing is mixed nut. And then fifth thing is, oh, energy bar. It'll be nice to carry around when I'm hungry. But I was just thinking about it. I was just smiling. I didn't pray or anything like that. But three months later, I was sent to the hospital because of my nutrition. I lost more than 50 pounds and, uh, in three months. So I was in hospital recovering for several months, and then my mom from Seattle, Washington, came to visit me. This is the first time ever North Korean government is allowing family members to come and visit the prisoner. So we had an uh, emotional reunion. Imagine, you know, your son is in North Korea, uh, was in prison, but now is hospital because of malnutrition. It's just a, a very, very emotional reunion. The second day she came to see me, we're talking. Oh, she said, oh, by the way, I brought you something. She opened her bag. First thing she took out was Hawaiian chocolate with my Canadian nut. Second thing was Kit Kat. <laughs> Third thing was beef jerky from Costco. Fourth thing was mixed nut. Fifth thing was energy bar. She didn't bring anything else for food. I didn't pray. I didn't ask my mom. I didn't call my mom and say, I want some my chocolate. I didn't do any of that. I didn't tell anybody about it. Actually, I forgot the fact that I thought about this. This was five months ago. Apparently, God remembered. Our God is good God. Not because he gave me chocolate. <laughs> because he said, Kenneth, I care about you. I am with you. It's almost like I, cre I created it you. I made you. So I know the craving of your heart, even though the craving of your stomach. <laughs> so, Kenneth, I am with you. I'm telling this story everywhere I go. And now every, every time, I'm getting so, so, many, so much chocolates. That's why I gain all my weight back now. No, I'm just telling this story because if God is this good, he's worth going to prison for. Jesus is worth living our life for, isn't it? And he's, he's a, such a good, loving God. So I was thinking that even if I cannot go home, he's worth trusting, giving, following my life for. I was there for about a year. Uh, and then finally, US envoy arrived. Uh, someone from White House, very important people, person came. And then 
he looked at me and said, I'm sorry, Kenneth, I cannot take you home. I was devastated. I thought, I'm going home. I've been here the longest. I've been suffering. I may die any time, just like um, just hard labor is just very difficult to endure. But yet, he said, Kenneth, I'm sorry. And two weeks later, my mom sent me the letter and said this. You need a faith like a, a Daniel's three friends. Our God is able to save us, even if he does not. You need that kind of faith. So I knew I wasn't able to go home anytime soon. So about three weeks, I pondered and pondered. Finally, I knelt down on my hospital bed, and I prayed like this. Lord, you know my heart. I want to go home. So think about my family you know, waiting for me. Think about all these people praying for me. I should go home. I must go home. But not my will, but your will be done. I give up my right to go home. Use me, O oh Lord. That was probably the most difficult prayer I ever prayed in my whole life. And then the Lord spoke to me like this. Kenneth, do you love me? But he said, do you love me more than these? What he meant was, do you love me more than your wife, more than your children, more than your ministry, more than everything you've been living for? Do you love me more? I knew the answer is no. I still say yes. I love you, O oh Lord. And the Lord said, then feed my sheep, take care of my lamb. See, Kenneth, you're not here as a prisoner, but you are here as my son, representing my kingdom. You are my missionary. You are my shepherd. You go and feed my sheep. There are 30 or 40 guards around me. There are other officials. But I already saw them as an oppressor, that people, they make sure that people are like yelling and screaming. And, you know, I just want to get away from them. And so every day my prayer was, save me, O Lord. Send me home. But my prayer changed. Use me, O Lord. I, and the God said, these are the lost sheep that I have sent you for. And God's compassion came over. And I told her, Lord, Lord, I don't know how to do this. I mean, it's not like they're nice. Or they see me as a traitor, see me as uh, you know, someone that deserves to die, but, have, but in prison. So... I had to ask the Lord, help me, O oh Lord. But God started to open the door. My prison number was 103. Normally, they would call me 103. In Korean, he said, 103. And I said, yes. <laughs> they, we don't have anything, you know? I had to get up like this. But, when, but that's how you work in prison. But when I'm there, and they're, one, they're by themselves, one by one, they come to me and say, Pastor, can I talk to you? And they're talking about their marriage problems, family issue. I'm doing premarital counseling, marriage counseling, parenting counseling. And I started to become their shepherd and their friend. And one of them asked me like this, Pastor, if I believe in God like you, is there anything I get? I mean, do I get something out of it? Is that a benefit? Of course, God has, you know, God answered the prayer. And, you know, God has given this and given that. And said, Wow, I envy you because our government doesn't give me anything. You know, just to help yourself. But you pray and God will give it to you. I envy you. The other person said this. Pastor, if I believe in God like you, then what do I have to pay to your church? Is that a membership fee? You know, almost like you were saying that it's financial obligation. And I say, oh, you know, I say, of course. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> yes, you know. <laughs> no, I said, more importantly, you got to give your life to, to God first. I was there for two years. And one of the young guards asked me, you know, I heard about, you know, you said God is real. Then how come you're still here? It doesn't make any sense. No one suffers as much as you have done. No one, you, you know, you have been here the longest. But you stick when you pray, God, listen to your prayer. How come you're still here suffering? I, almost, I went to... Uh, from the prison to hospital three times because of malnutrition. Every time, I almost die. But they see me the suffering there, then how it doesn't make any sense. I say, maybe God has a different plan. You, his plan may include you. Without me, 
how are you going to hear about God or anything from outside? He said, it's true. I never heard anything like this before in my whole life. See, when I was being investigated, one of the, you know, the investigator asked me, I, I heard about God before, but never heard about Jesus before. Tell me, where does Jesus live, in Korea or China? I thought he was kidding. This guy was born in Pyongyang, capital city. He went to college there. He worked for National Security Bureau. So, you know, it's like for, for us, like FBI or NSA, he's 30-some years old. He said he never heard the name Jesus before. That's what it's like to live in North Korea. North Korea, especially the Pyongyang, used to be called as Jerusalem of Far East. They are the largest Christian community in Asia was in Pyongyang, and there were the largest church, largest seminary, largest Christian school. It was a Christian Mecca 100 years ago, but now it become a desolate place, and then the name of Jesus disappeared. I met with uh, hundreds of North Korean refugees since I came home. I haven't met anyone who said, who knew about name Jesus before they escaped from North Korea. So why, what, what happened to North Korea? What, what, what do I mean by that? In 1960, when Juche ideology, several alliance that came in, they, they established it, they demolished all the churches, killed all the pastors, they burned all the Bible, and then decided to take name Jesus out of the society. You can find it anywhere, newspaper, textbook, encyclopedia, movies. There's no name Jesus there. Why? Simply you can find the answer from the Bible. Because Jesus is the only way, truth, and life. No one can come to the Father except through him. So if you take the name Jesus out of the culture, how are they going to find the way? How are they going to seek truth? How are they going to receive life? simple. They knew that's how it controlled their people. You know, become, use them as a slave, bondage and sin and suffer and control. And then what? When they die, they go to hell. hell. That's what it's been like last 60 years, guys. But I was there. I was the only one who knew the name Jesus. No one knows. But I cannot preach the gospel to them. Because if they say, I want to believe in Jesus too, then they will arrest him, arrest their children, their parents, three generations to be killed. That's the penalty for believing in Jesus in North Korea. Because they see it as more political crime. Because they can only serve their living God, which is that God, which is Kim Il-sung, and if you serve any other God, then you are traitors. So I was there. I cannot preach the gospel. The Lord reminded me this um, illustration that I learned when I was in seminary. It's about a uh, you know, missionary who was serving in remote village in India. But this is a tribe that has a different, you know, the different uh, the language than the majorities. So he had to learn this, the, their tribe you know, language. But it was so difficult to learn. So he was there for three years. He just couldn't speak enough to share gospel. Five years, seven years, 10 years, not much that happened. So the church said, why don't you come back? And then they sent another person in his, spot, in his place. And this young man was very gifted in the linguistics. So after three years, he was able to speak, and he was confident to share the gospel. So he got everybody together. All the village people got together, and then he shared the gospel for the first time. And then he said, who wants to believe in, who wants to receive Jesus into your life? And then everybody raised, everybody raised their hand. And I said, okay, this doesn't make sense. So maybe I made a mistake. So he just repeated the same message again, who wants to believe in Jesus? And everybody raised their hand. He was a little frustrated. Do you really know who Jesus is? And then the village chief raised his hand, and he said this. Jesus was with us for the last 10 years. See, 
he just reminded me that to not preach the gospel, live out the gospel, you may be the only Jesus they will ever get to see in their lifetime. So be a little Jesus to them. How do I become a little Jesus to them? This is a prison. It's not like they're nice, and, but a lot of people were there. Uh, I, I don't know how to be a Jesus like, like a Jesus. Every morning I pray, oh, Lord, help me to not to dishonor your name. Teach me your way, oh, Lord. So it was difficult task. I was living there. And then and then um, one day, another good news. In two days, U.S. envoy is going to come. So get ready to go. You are about to set free. And I say, finally, freedom. I was, I was just rejoicing. I was telling everybody goodbye. And I say, thank you so much. And I even sang a farewell song in Korean. And then, you know, now it's time to farewell. I was just singing like, and I see you again next time. I was singing. And then they were saying, don't sing such a sad song. You're making us sad. Why do you want to go home so early? We like having you here. You should talk to us some more. You've only been in two years now. Why do you want to go home so early? And I say, sooner I go home, sooner I can come back. So hopefully not as a prisoner next time. So we're so sad. We're, say, we're just saying goodbye. But no one came. I waited for a whole week. Finally, prosecutor came and said, oh, that, that was canceled. I was so devastated. I realized choosing to give up my right to go home is not something I have to do at one time. I have to do it every day. And choosing to love God more is not something I need to do at one time. I have to do it every day. I realized every day, I, still want, I was still hoping to go home. I haven't truly given up. Or maybe I did that moment. But every single day was a test. So at night time, um, after dinner, they made me watch TV. I was about to watch TV, then power outage. 12 hours a day, power doesn't work. So no electricity means sleep, no. They say, stand, you can't go to sleep. It's so dark, no light or anything. I still have to sit in the chair and make sure that let them know that I am not sleeping. So I, can, I said, can I then sing a song? And then that's how he began. I'm starting to sing uh, the praise song to the Lord. Uh, because I don't have a, you know, hymn books. I cannot read uh, at the time. So all the songs that I sang in my high school youth group days, you know, there's, there's none like you. I love you, Lord. And you know, all those in moments like this, all those songs, you know, 80s and all the songs that I was, and I can remember singing, and even sing, I sang out the hymn, and then the verse saying like, that, whether I live in the shack or palace, if Jesus is with me, this is where heaven is. If Jesus is walking with me, this is where heaven is. So I changed the lyrics sometime, I, instead of shack and palace, I say, uh, whether I live in the prison or in hospital. If Jesus is with me, this is where heaven is. I'm singing the song softly, but because this is countryside, everybody can hear the singing of American prison. So I feel like I was having an you know, you know, evening concert every night. <laughs> I had like 40 audience. <laughs> you know, they're like, you know, sometimes they just clap too, you know. <laughs> I can hear them, you know, talking, and then they say, it's very strange. They say, hey, we are the guard. You are the prisoner. How come you look happier than us? Where does your joy and hope come from? And I say, come from God. Who is this Jesus you are singing about making you so happy? It doesn't make any sense. Who is this Jesus? When I left the warden of the prison, shook my hand, and he said only one word, see you again. And he had tears in his eyes. 
I knew that God has done something during the time in the prison of North Korea. See, when I left uh, right that week, this is what happened. November 3rd was two-year anniversary. November 1st on Saturday, prosecutor came to see me and say, hey, you only, you've been here for two years. Now you only need to stay 13 more years now. 13 years later, you'll be 60. We'll celebrate your 60th birthday together. No one is coming for you. You've been forgotten. You've been abandoned by your government. So you're doomed. And then he left. So, but he said this every Saturday at 3 o'clock for last one year, 52 times. So I nicknamed him Mr. Disappointment. When Mr. Disappointment come, I get disappointed. It doesn't matter. I read the Bible. I praise the Lord. I say, I fix my eye upon the Lord. I still get disappointed because I'm a human being. I'm weak. Not only disappointed, and then I get, I become hopeless. I become desperate. I become depressed. And I was going to become insane. So I had to choose every time whether to listen to Mr. Disappointment or listen to the Lord, who have given more than 70 verses, and then more than 450 people around the world sent me a letter and said, Kenneth, you are not forgotten. We are praying for you. We're worshiping uh, you know, in behalf of you, and we are remembering you, Kenneth. Some of the people in Maryland, including the people from some of the people of Hope, and you know, Pastor John Lee's church, wrote me a letter, so I knew who are the, they, they couldn't say that their name because they don't want to be tracked down or something. But it has actually a different code on it. I, I can't figure out who that person that was. But it was truly a word of hope. Yes, people out there are praying for me. They're remembering me. So, so I had to choose. But because I'm a human being, I have to go to the, in the bathroom, <laughs> looking at the mirror, and remember who you are. You are a missionary. You are here for the reason. Then I said to myself, looking at the mirror, my name is Kenneth Bear. I'm a missionary. I probably have to say this more than 100 times during the time in North Korea. I have to remind myself my identity. I was there doing what God called me to do. And knowing that there's a greater purpose for for me to be there. On Monday, November 3rd, two-year anniversary, Lord woke me up early. And then he said, Kenneth, open your Bible to Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 20. I never heard God's word, God speak to me like this before. I have no idea what that was. I opened my NIV Bible and he said, I will bring you home. It was Monday. Friday, U.S. envoy arrived, November 7th. November 8th, I came home. And director of national intelligence came to get me home with 20-some other officials uh, with a big plane, U.S. government plane, say, United States of America. And then as I was in the plane, I was coming home, and then and I told the people that, on November 3rd, on Monday, God spoke to me that he would bring me home. They were so shocked. We left Washington, D.C. White House November 3rd. So God spoke to me. God sent the U.S. government plane over. So, I, so now I'm telling people, I, President Obama knows my name. Because he's the one that sent people to get me home. But more importantly, Heavenly Father knows my name. Heavenly Father knows your name. Every single one of your name is written in heaven's special book. So on the way home, this is what the Lord said, Kenneth, you know how many people around the world pray for you? Millions of people pray for you, Kenneth. They haven't forgotten you. And I have not forgotten you either. And I haven't forgotten 25 million North Korean people either. So go home and tell the world what I've done for you and tell them because they remember and pray still with me, 
Prayer was answered. I was released. I was able to come home. In the same way, if we this people decided that, they, okay, we will pray for people in North Korea, remember them and stand with them, God will listen to the cry out of people around the world and answer the prayer, and I will bring them home. Just, and then restore them, rebuild their life. And God has, that's the message God has given us. So since then, then I came out and I travel around the world and share my story like I was sharing just now. And then after the message, somebody in the audience come up to me and say, Can Pastor Tennis, I pray for you, I pray for you. Cambodia, El Salvador, and, and all of Germany, and everywhere I go in El Salvador, nine-year-old boy came up to me from the small village, and he said this, Pastor, when I was five, I prayed for you for every day for two years. Why would a boy from El Salvador pray for me every day? I went to Brazil, and this, this time, then it was about 10,000 people were gathered and I was preaching to them and afterward that uh, one of the grandmother on the wheelchair came over and somebody brought that wheelchair, wheelchair, the, the you know, grandmother in the wheelchair. She said this, I'm 103 year old but I have to confess that until this moment, until today, I have not prayed for North Korea in my whole life. But because now I have heard you, I will promise you until I see Jesus face to face, I will pray for, remember, North Korea every day in my life. Until I see Jesus. So I realized that is why I was in prison for two years and five days. When I came out, you know, it was televised in CNN, BBC, and ABC. All outlet was, uh, it was live. Kenneth Faye is arriving. He said, so, um, so many cameras were there. I had to make brief statements. And then next day, you know, um, just uh, they thought that I was going to show up at my sister's church. There were like hundreds of cameras that were there. And, but, you know, all kinds of stuff was happening. So, so when I got, when I, next day, when I went to Starbucks with some of my friends, everybody recognized me. When I was walking on the street, people were honking the horn and said, Can I welcome home? It was just crazy. So on the third day, I had to put sunglasses on and I, with a hat on, with a baseball cap on, and I went to the mall to buy some clothes. I lost so much weight and I needed some clothes. I walked into the mall and there was an African American lady. She's a, you know, huge, but she's over there and she saw me walking in. She started screaming, Kenneth! And I said, I was a little scared and then she started running toward me. She gave me a big hug and tears dripping down, and she said, Kenneth, I pray for you for two years every day. Why? Why would the people around the world pray for me? I'm not that special. I didn't do that much. What did I do? And I realized, two years in North Korea was the beginning of something. God was doing something. And I have some tests to do. Since then, I studied this Nehemiah 1 million prayer petition campaign. We haven't read the scripture here tonight, but this morning. We're talking about Nehemiah. If you have it up, you can up there. You can put it up there if you want. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 17 through 18. But it's about Nehemiah who remembered the people who were left behind and they were suffering, and he prayed for his people, and finally his prayer was answered that he was able to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall and to restore the God's people, become a nation of nation that served the Lord one, one more time. So here is a Nehemiah that is saying that is we want to okay, you have it up there. So you see the trouble where in Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned and with the fire, come let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. And then everybody said, yes, we will rebuild. In Isaiah chapter 61, you know, talking about restoration, rebuilders, 
and especially chapter 61, verse 4, talking about these are the people that uh, they will be the one that will be rebuilding. And the places demonstrated, they will, they will rebuild. I was thinking that North Korea, no name of Jesus is available. The reason, so I say, the only thing that can ha what will happen is we must to see reunification of North and South Korea. Not because of a uh, uh, nuclear program and different things, but because we used to be one nation. And not only so, that way, that, that's the only way everyone in North Korea can hear the name Jesus freely without fearing their life. And since then that I studied this, Nehemiah, one million prayer petition, 177,000 people signed a petition to President Obama and said, please bring Kenneth Day home. So I came home because President Obama sent U.S. envoy to get me home. How about we do that to our Lord? If we get one million people around the world to sign up and pray and lift up, lift, you know, just pray for the people in North Korea, remember them, not looking at the other way for their suffering, what will happen? So I started this campaign, so you can go to the website, so pray number four nk.org. You can QR, there's QR codes there. There is a sign up sheets over there if you wanna uh, after the service and you can sign up or just QR code use it and just go ahead and do that left in a, in a digital lease. Uh, now we have people from 100 countries, from 1,001 cities, and there are people out there and say they are say yes we will remember we will stand with and pray for the people in North Korea. So this, could, this, is, uh, this could be your commitment to say, what can I do, oh Lord? Pray for people in North Korea. If you write down your email address, we'll make sure that we send you prayer updates so you know how to pray, what to pray. And then the same prayer topic is pray among uh, the, we want to make sure that by end of this year, we have 10,000 Nehemiah prayer warriors signed up to pray together around the world and globe. And this is one thing that, that I am now in part of uh, doing. And then there is a new organization called New Korea Foundation International. This was founded in US. We have some people even in DC area are now participating. But this is very important uh, to uh, preparing that waiting for the, uh, you know, the North Korea government's collapse and seeing um, the reunification. So after that, we have to be ready what to do after the reunification. How, how, are, we gonna how are we gonna prepare? So we wanted to make sure that we wanted to uh, mobilize people for prayer, mobilize people for training, mobilize uh, finance, mobilize networkings, and then also, uh, one of the things that I, we are now praying right now is, uh, we call it the Hope Center in Pyongyang. Uh, same idea is uh, having a more like a mission incubator, mission uh, compound where a lot of different ministry can use a building uh, and then teamwork together and, and then um, train and, and, and then use it as an incubator to start many ministry out of North Korea. So one of the things that, this is this kind of things in, in right now in motion. Another thing in motion will be uh, getting the Bible ready. Means in North Korea, in, um, especially in Pyongyang, there's about one million households. We wanna make sure that in North Korea open, within the first 30 days, we can deliver one million Bible to every single household in Pyongyang and share the gospel, gospel with them. So we only get at least one million hard copies and digital copies available and to be able to bring into North Korea and to deliver. Um, and so this is something we are doing and this is actual Bible. This, this kind of actual Bible that we are now um, getting ready to print. Uh, more Bible to be ready to give out, hand out as a gift uh, so that people can hear and know the word of God for the first time. So just closing up like this, guys. Um, 
thank you for your prayer. Thank you for remembering me when I was in prison. And as there are many of you, I knew, I, we, we, we knew each other, we were friends even before I was in North Korea. Because of your prayer that I'm able to stand in front of you, prayer produced miracle. If you want to see miracle, pray. If you want to see miracle, come together as a body of the Christ. And I seek God and his word, and God will speak to you in obeying. So now I say this to people, if suffering is no longer an obstacle in my life, but it is a shortcut to enter into God's heart. So trust that even despite the suffering, God brought something out of it. I'm traveling all over the world. I'm going to Germany after this on Wednesday and um, I'm speaking at different places. But all that, I want to see that God had of his plan. And I know that time for reunification, time for North Korea, people to be free will be coming very soon. And so please keep people in North Korea in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are in charge of all things. We love you. So we just wanted to continue to honor you um, and just continue to obey you, whatever you ask us to do, O oh Lord. So, Lord, O oh Lord, just like Nehemiah, just like Isaiah have talked about, that we near, you are looking for people to become like a Nehemiah for this generation, to rebuild the, the ancient ruins, O oh Lord. Rebuild the people, in, especially in heaven, no access to name Jesus, O oh Lord. So we just ask, use us in a special way. We have no idea what to do, but use us and bring your kingdom come soon so that the many lives will be transformed. They'll be able to praise you, worship you, and honor you through their life, O oh Lord. We thank you for the Hope Church. Thank you for what you have done through uh, the ministry here to bring your kingdom to the neighbor and around the world. So we give you honor and glory to you in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.